Hi guys, this is going to be the beginning of our civil or tort law lecture. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you, we're just going to start this today, but it's going to continue into uh, the next couple weeks. So this is just going to be the very beginning of this. Now, usually this is just what we call unit three. As if we go into this unit, I do need to hark back to what we've discussed previously, just to be certain that we're all on the same page as far as what's the difference between criminal law and civil or tort law. Now, just to kind of quick recap, because I know we've talked about these before, in regards to criminal law, for criminal law, this is going to be where an individual or even a group commits a crime, where this is a crime against the state, against the government. Now, we've kind of talked about some examples of this. It can be murder or burglary or arson or whatever. But when this crime has been committed under criminal law, the punishments are very different versus civil. In criminal law, you can face jail time or other punishments that we've talked about in the past, be it a suspended sentence, probation, fines, etc. Now, as we shift and we talk about civil law, you have to understand civil law is not breaking a law that the state has passed. It's not breaking a law that is passed by state legislators, signed by the governor, or even at the federal level that's passed by Congress and signed by the president. Civil law is just simply we are going to be figuring out a dispute between two parties. No crime has been committed. We just need to be certain that there is going to be a restitution, that there is a resolving of the problem between those individuals or groups. Now, we had kind of talked before about how, yes, divorce is a civil action. Divorce is simply saying that these two people will no longer be legally married, that they are going to split, and now we need legal action to split up the assets. So we say that a person or a group has been impacted, and it's up to the court to decide how they're going to move forward, what's acceptable to make everyone whole again. So what that means is, as far as punishments go, in a civil case, there is no jail time, there is no probation, nothing like that. It's all centered around money that's going to be paid. So that money that's going to be paid is what's used to make people whole again. Should there be a, a lawsuit or a, uh, um, a civil suit that's brought against them. So really it's just the exchanging of money. Now, as long as we are on the same page with difference between civil and criminal, we can move on and talk about what civil law entails. Now, first off, there are really two basic questions in regards to civil law or tort law. The first big question is just who is responsible? Who's at fault? Who caused this harm that took place? Now, you can see that I simply use this picture as an example. A car accident can really be the beginning of a civil lawsuit proceeding. Now, in this little example, I'm just going to say that there is one person who hit the other one, that yes, there was no criminal law involved, but because there is one person that hit another one, you need to decide who is responsible for the damage that was caused. Because again, in used to using this little example, if one person causes a car accident and they don't have any insurance, the person whose car is damaged has to be made whole again. So in this little example, if this white car hit this blue car, they're the one responsible. They need to be held responsible to fix the damage of the blue car, which means what should the remedy be? What should the damages be for the harm that was caused? Now, again, just going back to this example, if you can fix this blue truck for X amount of dollars, then the person who caused that damage is responsible for paying the owner of the blue truck X amount of dollars. You're just being made whole again. You're making that truck functional once more. But it's not just necessarily as black and white as I'm going to pay X amount to fix the truck. There can be several other issues at hand. There can be many other things that this person can sue the person who's responsible for. So I do want to just give you some examples going forward here as to who can be sued, who is possible, who's, who's an option. You can sue individual people. They can be brought up in a lawsuit. 
you can have individuals suing individuals. Now, just like divorce, it's going to be an individual against an individual. Now, also, you can sue groups. Groups can sue an individual or vice versa. Individuals can sue a group. When I say a group, I mean it can be just multiple people for one instance that took place. It can go wider than that where it can be, you know, um, you know, people who are responsible for the same incident. But moving forward, you can also sue organizations. By this, I mean you can sue like labor unions. You can sue special interest groups. They are eligible to be sued. Now, also, you can sue corporations, companies that might have wronged an individual or groups. They can be brought to court. Now, I always kind of save this last one because it gets very complicated. The government can be sued sometimes, but oftentimes government individuals or government agencies are at least somewhat protected from civil lawsuits. So I always put in there, sometimes the government can be sued, but it's considerably more difficult and complex than the previous groups discussed. Now, the people who are doing the suing, who are bringing the case, are called the plaintiffs. They're the ones who believe that, yes, they have been wronged, they have been harmed, and they need restitution. They need to be made whole again. So the plaintiff sues the defendant. The defendant is the one who is defending themselves against this lawsuit. So plaintiffs often look for the defendants with what's called the deepest pockets. Now, a plaintiff can bring multiple lawsuits for really the same incident. They can sue multiple individuals or groups or corporations for the same incident that took place. The reason why they look for the defendant with the deepest pockets is because that person is either A, more, uh, more willing to settle a suit before it even goes to court, or B, the plaintiff can get the most amount of damages out of that defendant. So I do want to give you an example of something that took place uh, several years ago where a plaintiff sued multiple different individuals and groups based on who she felt was most responsible. Now, in this particular case, this is going to be the case of Aaron Andrews against Michael Barrett. Now, just to kind of give you some background on this, uh, Aaron Andrews is a TV personality. Uh, she used to work for ESPN when this lawsuit took place. Uh, during this time, she was a sideline reporter for uh, uh, multiple events that ESPN would cover. Uh, since then, I believe she's moved on to ABC, if I remember correctly, but she was a TV personality. And there was one moment where she was in a particular city preparing to uh, to be the sideline reporter of a football game. And she was staying in a hotel where Michael Barrett, I believe if I remember correctly, he did work there at one point. Michael Barrett knew that Aaron Andrews would be in a certain hotel room, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain hotel room. So before she entered, he took the peephole of that hotel room and flipped it around so that he could look into her room through the peephole. Now, in doing so, he is actually going to uh, to look through that peephole and film Aaron Andrews changing before she is going to go to her sideline reporting job. And he had video of her undressing. Now, eventually, this is going to get out and it even gets onto the internet. And it caused a very big problem, not only for Aaron Andrews, but for her employer as well. So Aaron Andrews is going to sue Michael Barrett for what took place. Now, also what happened was there was a criminal proceeding that happened. Michael Barrett was found guilty, and he is going to have to serve 30 months in prison, or at least convicted and sentenced to 30 months in prison for stalking of Aaron Andrews. But beyond that, there is going to be room for a civil case. Aaron Andrews is going to sue him, but also the hotel as well. What Aaron Andrews and her lawyer said is, yes, Michael Barrett was responsible for this, but the hotel is responsible as well. They are going to, at least in one way or another, allow him access to the outside of that room. They didn't necessarily do anything to stop this. They are at least somewhat negligent in what took place. Now, I always kind of bring this up and I ask the question, well, who probably has more money for Aaron Andrews and her employer to sue for. 
Michael Barrett was just an, an individual versus the hotel chain that's a large corporation. So they're going to go after both Michael Barrett and the hotel chain for emotional distress and invasion of privacy. Now, again, you can kind of look at this scenario and say, well, the hotel was mildly responsible, but it was Michael Barrett, the one that did it. He was the one who was responsible for it. But what Aaron Andrews lawyers say is, well, without the hotel, Michael Barrett could have never done this. So they're going to sue both of them. And the court's going to decide that, yes, this was an invasion of privacy, which caused severe emotional distress to Aaron Andrews. They award her and her employer $55 million. 51% of it was supposed to be paid by Barrett, and 49% of it was to be paid by the hotel. Now, what the court decided is, again, that yes, Barrett was responsible. He's the one who did it, so he is 51% responsible. Now, the odds of getting 51% of $55 million from an individual is very few and far between. That 49% of $55 million paid by the hotel is much more likely to actually happen. So I use this to explain how can damages be shared. In that particular instance, the damages are going to be split almost evenly between Barrett and the hotel because the court found that, yes, he was more responsible. He had more of the, the action that took place. He was 51% in regards to comparative negligence, which is dividing the loss according to which person or group is most responsible. Now, you might look at how it's divided up in his case and disagree with that. You might say that he was considerably more responsible than the hotel was. If you can make that case, that's perfectly acceptable. But I do want to go ahead and just give you an example of another case. This happened uh, several years ago of jumping on a trampoline in spikes and cleats. There was a man, uh, this was years ago, who was jumping on a trampoline in golf shoes in spikes. And what happened was, of course, the spikes are going to tear the fabric of the trampoline. He sued and said that it was the trampoline manufacturer who was responsible for his injuries because they did not build, um, uh, the fabric wasn't strong enough to hold his weight. Well, when it eventually goes to court, what the court decides was, well, you were 75% responsible because you shouldn't have been jumping on a trampoline in spikes and cleats. But potentially that particular company was at least mildly responsible because their fabric, in fact, did not hold his weight. So what the court decided was the person who did it, the man who was jumping on the trampoline in cleats, was 75% responsible for his injuries. So he cannot be awarded damages for 75% of what he claims. But he did get 25% of what he claimed because the court found that that company was 25% responsible for his injuries. Off the top of my head, I forget exactly how much money he sued for, but he did get 25% of what he asked. This is comparative negligence. 